why does your hair fall out when you get cancer? My mom is going through chemo, and she's tired and sick all the time, and her hair is falling out. Why is that? I was hosting a health forum in the South Bronx, one of my first, when a student of color named Laquisha uh, raised her hand and asked that question. It took me aback at first, but it also revealed a few things about the community I was presenting to. It showed me that the students I was presenting to, they didn't have the opportunities to talk about health that they sorely needed. But also that maybe diseases may be more prevalent in this community than I had previously thought. That second point became immediately clear to me as the entire room lit up with similar stories about families struggling with diseases and cancers. A young boy named Deshaun raised his hand and talked about how his mother was battling uh, with breast cancer, about how his father uh, told him that he would rather die than get screened for prostate cancer. Well, a few years later, his father would end up succumbing to that disease due to late exposure to healthcare. My name is Mulhar. I'm a student scientist, healthcare activist, and high school senior from the Bronx. Through growing up in culturally rich communities all of my life, I have been passionate about fostering that diversity. So it brought me uh, in 2016 to an internship at a local nonprofit called Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, which uh, was working to, to promote health equity in a uh, uh, community of color called East Flatbush in Brooklyn. There, I learned about this crisis of health disparities afflicting nearly every community of color in America today. So what are health disparities? Well, a poor health outcome suffered by a minority group is termed a health disparity. In practice, that means that simply based on your race or ethnicity, you may be more likely to get a disease or cancer. So you'd be probably be right in thinking that uh, genetic factors play an important role. For example, African-American communities suffer from genetically aggressive prostate and breast cancers, which leads to worse outcomes. There's also behavioral factors. Inner city communities, for example, are particularly strained under high smoking rates and high BMI, which lead to uh, more aggressive disease. There's a third factor that is often understudied, and that is that the drugs that are currently available do not work as well in patients of color um, as their white counterparts. Now, to explain that, I'd like to talk about a scientific dilemma of yesteryear where researchers uh, studying mice would not include male mice in their trials. Uh, they didn't think it was important to have gender inclusiveness. Well, uh, scientific watchdogs soon found that the drugs which came out of those trials in exclusively male mice uh, did not work as well in females. And so the scientific community got together and they created new guidelines promoting gender inclusiveness in research studies. Well, we're finding out today that science is at the same precipice as the vast majority of research has been done in, uh, in mostly white patients. And the drugs which have come out consequently don't work as well in minority patients. Uh, now the reason for that stems from a legacy of distrust between healthcare professionals and their communities. Uh, which also comes from the sort of flashpoints of civil rights injustices, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. To put, uh, the, um, to put that into context, Deshaun's father, whose question uh, appeared at, at the start of this talk, and whose, whose father was struggling with prostate cancer, his father would, who was coming from incredibly painful disease, would not approach his healthcare professional, even though he was, he was so debilitating. Uh, that's the impact of health disparities in communities of color today. Now, at BHDC, I saw how work was being done to fight that challenge, and I was really heartened. One really interesting thing they were working on is uh, they were going into barber shops and salons and talking to their owners about recommending free colon cancer screenings to, to uh, clients. And that was really interesting to me because it showed me that different communities can deal with healthcare differently. So you can have this inner city community of color who trust their barbers more than the healthcare professionals deal with that and somehow find the healthcare that's needed for community members. But it also sort of disheartened me because I knew that the scale of health disparities was so immense. Here you had hundreds of thousands of patients of color dying every year from otherwise preventable diseases. To put those numbers into context, um, the er more hours of lo life are lost from health disparities than actually the entirety of the Iraq war combined. So 
you know, this crisis was going on and it seemed like what activism was working on where they were targeting people who were already suffering from chronic disease. Uh, you know, people who had colon cancer but didn't really know it yet. I knew that if something was gonna be done about this crisis, there needed to be a preventable, I mean, a preventative uh, uh, targeted program going on. So I thought back that maybe a new segment of the population should be targeted. Maybe the religious community who had incredibly strong ties with the communities of color uh, that we were hoping to target. Or maybe the healthcare community who were working on developing programs to improve health outcomes in minority communities. But then I realized that it would be young adults who would be prime candidates um, to be targeted. See, even back then I knew that the type of behavioral change that we were looking for, we couldn't find in adults because they had fixed actions of, of behavior, fixed ways of thinking. But students, I know people my age, were excited about changing their behavior. They wanted to try new things and be part of big solutions. So after my internship at Broken Health Disparity Center, I did what felt natural and started working on, uh, on inspiring youth. So I began doing health forums in communities in the, in the South Bronx. Uh, the workshop I talked about at the start of this talk was one of my first. And I put together some of my research at BHDC and talked about local health outcomes data for this community. Almost immediately, I could see that students were really engaging with that message of health disparities, getting those regular screenings and checkups with their healthcare professionals. But more importantly, they were excited about going into their communities and talking to their friends and family about health. So I decided to continue doing that work. I organized a 501c3 to, um, to allow me to host more uh, workshops. And I have about a, stu a dozen student volunteers that helped me do workshops all across all five boroughs of New York. Uh, we try to capture youth engagement and make our content simple and relatable so you students can understand. And we work to, make, to meet students where they are, be it the school, the after school programs, churches, community centers where they congregate. We work with uh, high schools and, uh, and make sure that conversations around health and health disparities are, are in their health curriculums so that health equity is foundational to the knowledge of every student. We uh, work to implement modules about health disparities into internship programs at local medical centers so that health equity and minority research is brought to the fore. We work with uh, scientific conferences and we present there so that trust is rebuilt between minority uh, communities and their healthcare professionals. And I think most importantly, we work with community leaders like the borough presidents and, and amplify the voices of the young students of color whose, whose ideas are underrepresented in the public discourse. So after three years of this work, me and my team decided to check in on how we were doing. We uh, decided to uh, create a questionnaire and focus group to measure students' knowledge and attitudes before and after each workshop. So the questionnaire uh, measured students' knowledge and attitudes about a variety of questions about health. And the focus group, which was conducted after the workshop, asked students a few questions and um, listened to some of their own. Now the questionnaire was really re revealing. It showed us that students didn't really know that much about health before each workshop, unfortunately, or even the impact of genetic or behavioral factors on health outcomes. Rather, students believe that health is the responsibility of their parents, their schools, their teachers, but just not their own. Thankfully, after the workshop, uh, that disparity and that misconception was rectified. The focus group was also really revealing. It showed us that nearly every student really wanted to make a difference in their community, wanted to do something. But they thought that because of their age, they wouldn't be making any sort of difference. But just by seeing another student present the, to them through this workshop, they realize that they actually are uniquely capable of, of doing something powerful. Laquisha, whose questions are at the workshop, is a really good example. So uh, during the workshop, she and her deskmate um, began brainstorming ideas about improving their community's health. They realized that combined, they have thousands of followers on social media and were quite savvy at those tools. So they decided to make a PSA uh, advising their community members on how to behave with healthcare professionals. So after months of filming and scripts and uh, actually going to uh, doctor's offices, they really did make that PSA and it did go viral and it was much appreciated by their friends and family. 
So I, I'm really happy to report that students' interest in improving the health of their community shows that they can be disruptors to the status quo of health disparities. As a next generation, they can seek the early disease screenings and checkups that are needed to alleviate this crisis. And more importantly, right now, they can be going deep into their communities, farther than any current health activism approach can go. Truly, the story of Laquisha and the hundreds of other youth activists already making a difference should hearten us that powerful disruptors to health disparities are on the way if we can support them. Thank you.